following lecture by Dr. Gordon H. Clark is entitled, What is Apologetics? The very <coughs> first thing to be made clear in the course in apologetics is the nature and scope of the subject. One must answer the question, what is apologetics? The situation is similar to that of the bumper sticker which reads, Christ is the answer. And it's not too flippant reaction, what is the question? Many a student has been disappointed with an apologetic system because its parts did not answer the questions he thought it should. And others have been deceived because they accepted so-called answers to questions that were irrelevant. Therefore, it is necessary at the beginning to state the nature and scope of apologetics. <clears throat> this may take more time than some are willing to spend, and it may be too elementary for others who are impatient of results. <clears throat> One example of impatience and misunderstanding will suffice to particularize the general principle. Knowing that the historical accuracy of the scriptures is under attack, and realizing that if the Bible is in error on earthly things, it cannot be trusted on heavenly things. A student may take great, even excessive delight in the archaeological discoveries that have corroborated the scriptural statements. I, too, delight in these archaeological confirmations. But one must understand <coughs> that they do not demonstrate the inerrancy of Scripture. To show that a document correctly describes one event is not to show that its other statements are true, since, too, the heavenly things outweigh in importance the particularities of history, and since archaeology can contribute nothing to the establishment of theological doctrine, <clears throat> one is forced to conclude that archaeological evidences are much less useful than empirical apologies are wont to think. And uh, as before, <clears throat> any time you wish to interrupt or ask questions, please do so. That doesn't irritate me at all. It's something I like. But I am getting ahead of my story. <clears throat> As a further introductory note, let us survey, very briefly, several views of what apologetics is. <clears throat> a book <clears throat> called Socrates or Christ, The Reformation of Christian Apologetics, a book written, or at least a chapter written by Greg Bonson in Foundations of Christian Scholarship, edited by Gary North. On page 192 and 193, and incidentally, <coughs> if you don't interrupt me, I shall interrupt me. <coughs> My good friend, Carl Henry, most of whose work I read before he ever publishes it, <coughs> has the unfortunate habit of name dropping. And I have remonstrated with him gently against this, and I have urged him to quote fewer people, many fewer, but quote them more at length so that the students or the readers will have more notion of the theories of the men he's talking about. Well, that's not his style, and I have my style. 
I think quoting is very important because otherwise you open yourself to the charge of uh, missing the point or erecting straw man or that sort of thing, being sloppy. So you need to quote and refer to specific authors. But I don't think you need to refer to a hundred spe different specific orders in ten pages. I'm exaggerating. I think maybe it takes Carl 15 pages to <laughs> refer to uh, But uh, at any rate, it is good to quote and nail the thing down. And now, <coughs> uh, uh, Bonson quotes Ram as giving more than a dozen definitions of apologetics. I'm not quoting the definitions, but I'm shortening them and mentioning them. <coughs> For example, first, and uh, some of this has to do with the relation between philosophy and apologetics. But uh, here are uh, ten things that are mentioned in Graham's book as Bonson quotes them. <coughs> One, philosophy is something for which theology has no need. Two, philosophy is theology's servant. I suppose theology needs philosophy. Three, philosophy is independent of theology. Four, truth is probability, which I suppose would be, uh, who's the fellow with millionaire? Sproul. Yeah. I suppose that would be Sproul's position. Truth is probability. Uh, fifth, uh, truth is consistency a view which has sometimes been attributed to me, but although in a sense correct, it's very inadequate. Six, truth is paradox. That's uh, Kierkegaard and Van Til. And, um, oh, it is, yeah, it is, it is. And uh, particularly one of Van Til's defenders, Frame. I'll talk about Frame later on in the course. Uh, seven, uh, Truth is a common ground based on common grace. Eight, it's an evidence of the means of certifying Christianity. Nine, uh, truth is only appreciated after regeneration, never before. And truth in apologetics is irrelevant and useless, which I suppose most students would hope it would be. <laughs> etc. I just mentioned that to show there are quite a number of different views, maybe overlapping but nonetheless different, as to what apologetics is and what the relation of philosophic apologetics to Christianism. <clears throat> the previous mention of archaeology and the brief enumeration of a dozen or more aims and methods <clears throat> leads to a comparison of three different seminaries. There is one seminary, so I have been told, and therefore I won't give its name, since I've only been told this, but anyhow it's somebody's opinion of the seminary. <clears throat> so uh, there is one seminary that deliberately excludes what has usually been called apologetics, and has replaced it with archaeology. Now, I know what seminary I'm referring to, and I know at least one of the men is a friend of mine for many, many years. And I imagine that this statement is correct, but I've never checked it out, and so I won't mention the name of the seminary. But there's no apologetics, and it has been replaced by archaeology. This, I believe, is a major blunder. <coughs> There is another seminary whose courses basically represent one form of traditional apologetics, and I refer to Westminster Seminary and Professor Van Til's presuppositionalism. There is a third seminary, and it is the Conservative Baptist Seminary in Denver, 
where the courses in apologetics follow a different tradition, a tradition which in Presbyterian circles, they're Baptists of course, which in Presbyterian circles was represented by Hodge and Warfield. The mention of these seminaries and these professors indicates that apologetics is no easy subject. The latter two, that's Westminster and Conservative Baptist, the latter two, and indeed all three, make philosophically fundamental assumptions involving more than ordinary complexities. But as there seems to be no other than these three general possibilities, the answer to what apologetics is turns out to be a choice from among these three procedures. All of these procedures have one thing in common, and this concord can furnish a preliminary definition of apologetics. They all, in one way or another, seek to defend the truth of Christianity against the attacks of its enemies. But the three attempts to do this differ fundamentally from one another in their starting point, in the extent of the subject matter, and in their logical consistency. Since their very starting point is in question, each apology must begin by showing that his Christian and his non-Christian opponents fail at the beginning. Some impatient students want <coughs> so-called positive results immediately. They find the refutation of opposing views too negative time-consuming, and almost worthless. Yet, the only way to support the choice of one of these procedures rather than another <coughs> is to show that the others do not solve the problem. To counsel patients, to exhort the young student, and you all are pretty young, why, none of you remember the sinking of the Titanic. You're just little children. I wager, this is most marvelous, miraculous, and incredible, I wager that not many of you even remember the Second World War. It's hard for me to believe. Yeah. None of you were at the Battle of the Bulge? Oh, and you don't know anything about Penamunda? Ah, oh, terrible. Oh. To counsel patients, to exhort the young student to study long and hard, to stress difficulties in apologetics that even some mature apologetes underestimate, justifies a few more thoughts along this line. The Christian wishes in some way to defend Christianity. Now, in the world, Christianity competes not only with Buddhism, Islam, and Zen, and your seminary had the, I would say, the privilege of a man who wrote a pretty good book on Zen. He's no longer here. I keep up correspondence with him. I guess you all know him, don't you? But also, not only Islam, Buddhism, but also with Hegelianism, logical positivism, existentialism, and with what other philosophical systems there may be. <coughs> Since these systems use history, physics, psychology, linguistics, and the entire college curriculum, the Christian apology must have definite views and detailed arguments on all these subjects. <clears throat> Therefore, <clears throat> apologetics cannot be so narrowly restricted to a few popular points, nor so sharply distinguished from science and philosophy 
as some Christians think. Apologetics must be a comprehensive philosophy. This needs emphasis, not only among evangelicals at large, but even among those more closely connected with Calvinism, to confront secular systems, the Christian must present a system. Christianity is a system. And the ministers in traditional Presbyterianism and in the denomination of which I am a member acknowledge in their ordination vows that they accept a system of doctrine. The value, <clears throat> indeed the indispensable necessity of a system, can be illustrated from military annals. A single military action must attack some particular strong point at a given time. But to do so effectively, it must be part of a larger campaign. And the larger campaign must be governed by a plan that includes the whole war. And you don't even remember World War II. Now, Winston Churchill has six big volumes on World War II. Please read all six and see that he had a system. And it's just too bad that Franklin D. Roosevelt tried to minimize or undermine the system. And Oh, he agreed most to with it, but he made some awful blunders. Uh, we, we, uh, we are indebted not to Franklin D. Roosevelt, but to Winston Churchill. <coughs> Uh, not to speak of World War I or World War II, which you don't need to, you don't remember either of them. I'll take something maybe you do remember. Our Civil War. <laughs> Our Civil War was directed by an overall strategic plan. McClellan defended Washington. He did a good job of that, but he didn't do a good job of anything else. And he was supposed to do something else. McClellan defended Washington. Grant cleared the Mississippi and captured Vicksburg. Rosecrans fought from Nashville to Chattanooga, where again Grant defeated Bragg, and Sherman marched through Georgia from Atlanta to the sea. You know what song I'm quoting there? You don't even know the national song. Where, were, where did you grow up? Probably. <laughs> God save the queen and heaven bless the maple leaf forever. Well, I don't expect you to know our Civil War songs if you're a Canadian, but uh, just let's, let's raise the maple leaf. Uh, so too, as McClellan defended Washington, we must defend our base, the truth of Scripture and its main doctrines. But we must also attack secular science, secular historiography, and secular linguistics. The foundation of a strategy to meet all objections against Christianity is definitely technical. It is not a matter of ordinary, everyday conversation. Let me illustrate. <clears throat> On a very superficial level, yet indeed a lively contemporary controversy among professing Christians, is the question of speaking in tongues. One side says that those who have never had the experience cannot judge of the matter. The other side says that experience is not the criterion. We must rather judge experience by the Bible. Beyond the range of professing Christians, 
David Hume rejected miracles, and in particular, Christ's resurrection, on the basis of experience. Schleiermacher, early last century, initiated modernism by insisting that all doctrines must be tested by experience. This raises the fundamental problem of apologetics. When one says, I believe in the resurrection, or I believe in tongues, or even I believe in God, the non-Christian will ask, how do you know? This is true in physics and geology also. If someone asserts a law of physics or proposes a geological explanation of Yosemite, his colleagues will ask, how do you know? They want to examine his methods. They want to see his criteria for knowledge. Theories concerning the criteria for knowledge are, in technical language, called epistemology. When a scientist or an historian asserts that he knows something, his statement is not acceptable unless he explains how he came to know it. How do you know is the last question to be asked and epistemology is the first subject to be established. <clears throat> Some devout Christians do indeed accept an empirical epistemology. My very orthodox Lutheran friend, John Warwick Montgomery, you all know him, do you? You've heard him lecture. He's a very clever lecturer. <clears throat> oh, he's very interesting. I, I, that, I wasn't being derogatory, you know. He, 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 he's, he's brilliant, except he's wrong. <laughs> My very orthodox Lutheran friend, John White Montgomery, thinks we can achieve theological knowledge by simply reading it off historical events. A liberal like G. Ernest Wright also thinks this possible, but he reads off a vastly different theology. This lecture now aims to show that epistemology is basic to apologetics, and second, that empiricism is totally unsatisfactory. In the Middle Ages, during the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas substituted the empiricism of Aristotle for the so-called Christian Platonism of Augustine. Although Aquinas tried to make metaphysics the basic subject and thus reverse the position Augustine had given to epistemology, even so, Aquinas had to acknowledge that the crucial question came in epistemology. Instead of recognizing that God had endowed mankind with an original or a priori intellectual equipment, Aquinas held that man's mind started as an empty blank and all his knowledge began in sensory experience. I don't know whether Aquinas, I doubt that, I don't know whether Aquinas originated the phrase uh, tabula rasa. I doubt that anybody before him used it, but I just don't know, I'm not sure. But I do know that he used it. You will find it in uh, his text, the Latin text, that the mind at birth is a tabula rasa, a clean sheet, nothing written on it, absolutely without a priori equipment, blank mind, on which the experiences of sensation write themselves and are the basic elements of knowledge. <coughs> In modern times, Schleiermacher, with certain modifications I cannot take time to explain in this lecture, Schleiermacher introduced religious experience or empiricism into Protestantism. <coughs> Religion was to be based on experience. In effect, this eliminated theology 
in favor of the psychology of religious experience. Now, Schleiermacher apparently wished to retain a semblance of doctrinal orthodoxy, but his followers employed experience more and more consistently, dropping one doctrine after another until Schleiermacher's modernism became 20th century humanism. And if you wish to read the history of this development from Schleiermacher to modern humanism, <coughs> Edwin Burt has a book called Types of Religious Philosophy, <coughs> and his account of the history of it is better in the first edition than in the second. Uh, he may improve the second in other ways, but he dropped out uh, the history by which he traced, uh, the, uh, he traced the development of American modernism from Schleiermacher into uh, the humanism in which uh, you find it today or at least earlier in the century. And uh, that's, a, uh, that's a very good chapter to read. It's near the end of the book. It probably, the chapter heading is probably from modernism to humanism or something like that. And uh, it deals a good deal with the Chicago theology um, that, that began around, uh, around the First World War, maybe a little before, and uh, continued for a time. And I'm trying to think of uh, one of the men who defined God. I have such trouble with names. I can remember Plato and Aristotle, but I can't remember the names of Mer very many Americans. And so I forget. But anyhow, it's a good historical... Of course, uh, Bert is a humanist, uh, but his uh, historical account of the development from modernism to humanism is, is, is a very good historical account. <coughs> For this reason, <coughs> it is not effective strategy to defend one doctrine after another. Frontline fighting is essential, but it is doomed to defeat unless the enemy's central facilities of production are bombed out of existence. Therefore, we must oppose <coughs> not only the psychology of religious experience, but the central issue of empiricism as a whole. Empiricism is the theory that all knowledge depends on sensory perception. Thomas Aquinas, many Lutherans, unfortunately, and even some Calvinists have advocated this epistemology. But its chief exponents have been secularists like David Hume, Karl Marx, Bertrand Russell, and more recently the logical positivists with their slashing attack on metaphysics and theology. Please turn the tape for the continuation of this lecture. Some contemporary evangelicals, indeed some of my very good friends, support empiricism and claim that my arguments to the contrary merely repeat ancient Greek skepticism. This cavalier treatment must face a twofold reply. First, to say that an argument comes from a Greek skeptic does not refute the argument. A mere denial is never a refutation. What these evangelicals should do is to show precisely how the arguments are fallacious. This they have repeatedly failed to do. And I hold that on their principles they cannot do it. Then second, if these persons had read a few contemporary textbooks on psychology, they would not have asserted that these arguments merely repeat Greek skepticism. <coughs> That they overlap 
is no doubt true. But 20th century psychology adds details that the Greeks never thought of. Permit me, therefore, to mention just a few of the difficulties which, in my opinion, empiricism cannot handle. <clears throat> now, I must ask for your patience, but... Uh, the refutation of opposing theories is a preliminary to the establishment of my own view. And really that ought to be the method anybody takes. <clears throat> now, since empiricism seems to be very much common sense and people accept it uh, unthinkingly, uh, I want to spend a little time refuting the views of um, John White Montgomery. Uh, what's his name? I just mentioned a minute ago. Up there in Ligonier. I don't know why I always forget his name. I remember John White, but I, I have an awful trouble with names. I, I remember Carne Carneades, of course. know him quite well, but... Uh, any, anybody beyond antiquity I can hardly remember. I do remember World War I, though. There was a man by the name of Hindenburg. You know. <coughs> now, <coughs> here are some of the arguments that I use in opposition to empiricism. <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the most interesting ones. How many of you know the drawings by Escher? How how, 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 how much do you get? Oh, well, good. Oh, I'm glad to see there are some artists in the class. All right. I think Escher is a perfectly good argument against uh, John Warwick Montgomery and all empiricists. And Escher is not a Greek skeptic. He is a contemporary artist. And for the rest of you who don't know him, <coughs> uh, he has complicated the simple drawing, which nearly all of you have seen, of the stairway. And now you look at it, you, it seems that you're looking down on it, and then you blink your eyes and you're looking up from under it. And uh, it flutters back and forth in front of your eyes and you can't tell which flutter is the truth and which is false. So is experience. But Escher does it much better than the unartistic psychologists do. So if you haven't ever seen Escher's drawings, please do. I hope you have a copy of some of them in the library, do you? Those of you who raised your hands, did you see them in books here? I, I, mean, I wasn't raising my hand to say that I was doing this artwork. I was yes. trying to make a comment. Oh, just a minute. <coughs> well, does anybody know whether uh, his drawings are in a book in the library? Please, somebody find out and tell me tomorrow morning. Now, what's your question? <coughs> the, the difference, uh, yeah, when we, we view it one way, and then we blink our eyes and say, view it another way, could, we, could it be that the difference is not a disagreement about what is actually on the page, but it's a disagreement in how we happen to conceptualize it or organize it? Precisely, yes. And that's what happens all the time. But, uh, and hence you can't trust your senses. But then my point is that, that the senses at that point are not trying to make the senses. The there. senses give you two different impressions. And you're looking at the same piece of paper. If there's a piece of paper there to look at. Yeah, but I, I don't suppose that could say that, that there are two different um, that Oh, you have to. Yeah, he would have to say that there are that that the that part of the page is objective. An empirist would have to say that, but it's obviously false, because you see two different things on the page. 
So that's one of the right now representation of two dimensions. If that staircase was in front of you, you lift your hand and you go up and touch it and feel when you're looking up on it or looking down. Oh, you think the fingers are more accurate than the eyes. Well, I'll okay. take that up in a minute. Okay, in order to say that your senses perceive you, the only way you're going to be able to do that is to have one sense and the data you receive from that compared to another. And sense. if the two senses disagree between themselves, then what? To the to the one to which one? Oh yes, and therefore when you put a toothpick between your two fingers like this, you know it's two toothpicks and not one because you feel it as two and you see it as one. Mm. <laughs> and in addition to Escher, do you do you know what the trompe l'oeil is? Anybody know trompe l'oeil? Those that you know, if you know Escher, you must have known enough art to know trompe l'oeil. Huh? Well, it's a, the, the term, of course, means a deception of the eyes. But it's a particular method of painting. And uh, these paintings are so constructed, if you uh, put them on the wall, uh, a flat wall, you are quite sure that there's a recess there and you can put your hand and get it. Uh, and you see the recess. That's why it's called the uh, trump that deceives the eyes, yes? Uh, to me, I guess it doesn't, it doesn't follow from the idea that we don't always, uh, that, our, that we don't always distinguish reality properly by our senses, that reality is therefore indistinguishable. Uh, Let me ask you this question. If a witness in a criminal case is... Uh, is shown to have perjured himself, how much credence do you give to the other statements he made? Um, not a whole lot. Not a whole lot, yes. But my point is simply that... And since if your eyes deceive you once, you can't believe any of it. But then, by the very fact that we can conclude that our eyes have deceived us, it implies that there are some criteria on the basis of our senses by which we can say that they are deceived. No, not at all. You, o you only know that you have two, two sensations which contradict each other and cannot be, it's out, out. They can't both be true. You know one is false, but you don't know which one. But then, there's a, but the fact that but we do make judgments all the time. Yes, but we often make wrong judgments. Right. But there are judgments about which we agree uh, and we judge us about I mean, we, every time we talk, every time we talk and use language uh, that, that is drawn from the... Uh, from I the don't language. know whether we agree. Uh, I, I find more people who disagree with me than who agree. Yeah. There are things about which we agree. Uh, I'm not saying that we're always correct, but I think that there are some things that we can know on the basis of the But if, if two propositions are contradictories, they cannot both be true and your senses give you contradictory propositions. So whichever one is false, whichever one is true, the other is false, and hence you can't trust your senses. They've committed perjury. Yeah. Uh, next slide. I was going to say, um, I studied psychology in my undergraduate work, and one of my fields so is proprioception, which is the study of how the senses uh, interact with one another, and there's so much evidence showing how the senses constantly deceive each other uh, you can set up control experiments and uh, you can just amaze you by how much your senses can deceive one another. Um, and that's, that's quite a growing field for us. Uh, maybe once in a while somebody agrees with me. <laughs> Back there. Yeah, you. Yeah. Why, why have uh, a court system if we can't trust any witnesses? And why talk with trees when I'm sure for cars can hear it enough? I'm going to use that example as one of my main arguments. Uh, the court system. In fact, I used this with uh, John White Montgomery a little bit ago when we both talked in the same, to the same audience. Uh, <clears throat> this last winter, now I don't know whether, whether it was in January or February, it might even be, but rather recently, uh, a man who had been convicted of murder and who had been in jail for 15 years uh, was uh, let go because another man confessed to the murder. Now, here we had, in, in the original trial, you had 12 jurors. They all agreed on the 
witnesses' positions, from what the witnesses said, putting it all together, all 12 of them agreed that this man was guilty. Now, in a murder case, with the, uh, with the laws as they are to protect innocent people, and they're rather strict, 12 people, and I would suppose all of them, or nearly all of them, were quite honest. <coughs> Certainly most of them would be honest. Uh, Twelve people were con convinced beyond any moral doubt that this man had committed murder. And all twelve of them were wrong. So maybe that happens in one percent of the cases. And therefore, you discard all the other cases. On what basis do you think? So, so if you were, 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 no, I wouldn't. I would admit that it is frequently mistaken. Yep. So, are you then saying that the that our senses sometimes can be mistaken? Yes. Or are you saying that they're totally untrustworthy? If they contradict, they if they contradict, one of them may be right. You know. If, if the two things are contraries, well, then they can both be wrong. But if they're contradictories, one must be right. The trouble is, you can't tell which. You know one is wrong, but you don't know which one's wrong. Okay, but usually our senses don't conflict with each other, and then we can... Oh, I think they often do, more than just once. In fact, uh, I think I have that experience every day. Uh, I, I want to give the... Uh, and, uh, very well... Uh, doesn't it, I don't want to anticipate too much, but doesn't it seem like even to uh, say that we're people who base our, our apologetic on the Bible, or even our theology on the Bible, doesn't that imply the necessity of sense perception? No. So that we don't have to be able to uh, read the Bible or hear? Or I shall take up that question. But at present, I wish to show you you can't trust your senses. Please let me give other people. I, you know, I don't want to cut you off, but yes. I thought I should ask the question why instead of being defined empirically in the wild or empirically in the position of. Yes, the mind is a blank sheet at the start, and the first lessons it gets are from sensation. You're saying something that seems to affect it. All knowledge is based on sense experience? Yeah. I should have asked for this. Could you give me more to explain what you mean by basic? Oh, uh, yes. The mind has no a priori forms. The first tiny bit of information is a sensation. The next tiny bit is a sensation. And as these bits... Uh, 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 accumulate, uh, you put them together and so on, and, and the, the, the bits of sensation are organized into whatever complicated knowledge you might claim to have. But everything comes out of sensation. The mind as such has no form at all. There are no a priori forms. Uh, in, the, in the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, there used to be, maybe there still is, but I haven't been there in 10 years. There used to be a recess in the wall down in the basement around the corner. And in this recess, there was a vase with a rose in it. And under the, uh, on the wall, uh, under the recess, uh, there was a sign that you may put in your hand and take the rose, which, of course, I proceeded to try to do. And when I put it in my hand, the rose wasn't there anymore. When I took it out, there was the rose. I could see it quite clearly. Put it in my hand, the rose disappeared. Took my hand out, the rose was quite visible. Was there a rose there? Did my eyes tell me the truth or did they deceive me? I didn't touch the rose, but then that's the absence of a sensation that is But there is something peculiar about it. Because if your senses say two incompatible things, one of them must be false. 
Now, in this case, <coughs> the two incompatible data were not given at the same time. <coughs> you can say, uh, you can say, if you wish, that uh, there was a spring, and when you put your hand in, somehow you touched the spring, and the spring took the rose away, and then when you put your hand, the, the rose came back. But uh, that wasn't the way it was done. How does one know there is a habit? Beg pardon? How does one know there is a well, how do you how do you not know that the artist intended to um, draw a picture that would give? Well, I suppose he did. Yeah, and so, so that means he he, he to intended to deceive us, and we are deceived. Yes. Well, intended, our senses are doing the best way. They are doing the incorrect job correctly. On the empirical basis, everything in the mind is sensation and its combinations. There is anything else. But the only data which the senses conveyed. I didn't touch there. it. You, you can't touch it. There's no sense of touch at all there. You reached out to touch it. You didn't touch it. It disappeared. No, no. There's no contradiction until the mind causes the contradiction. It's not the senses saying the contradiction. The two senses contradict. Is the mind that received the input of the two senses is assuming the law of non contradiction? No, no. Because in empiricism, the mind has no a priori form. It's totally blank. And on their theory, you must construct the law of contradiction from the sensations. And that's something else I'm going to try to show is impossible. I don't want to even know that there are two contradictory um, elements there, apart from the sensations. It seems like you have to know that you have to admit the empiricism that you have to Yes, that's right. Only they're not data. Uh, now, I, if I had the graceful, long fingers that some charming young ladies in this course have, I could run uh, what's uh, the symphony, the famous real fast scales. You know who I mean. Sonata K554. Anyhow, you notice my, 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 what's that? Hmm? No, it's not the right. <laughs> I'll think of it in a minute, but I can't, hard for me to remember. Now, if I had long, graceful fingers like some of the young ladies have who can run scales, you could take a toothpick or something like this, and you see one thing going through your fingers, you feel two. Here, these sensations occur at the same time, and they cannot both be true. But you have these two inconsistent, incompatible sensations at the same time. Or, uh, take uh, another familiar illustration, uh, the fishing pole that you drop into the water. It looks crooked, but as the gentleman on the left says, you always trust your fingers and not your eyes. It feels straight but it looks crooked. The two senses contradict each other at the same time. This concludes Dr. Clark's lecture entitled, What is Apologetic?